Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you guys and be with my spiritual family. It's something I look forward to every Sunday. I sometimes get to go to other churches. I sometimes get to go speak um, in other countries, in other churches, other states. But my favorite place to go to on a Sunday is right here with you guys. You guys are incredible. I love my spiritual family. I love what the Bible says that God puts the lonely in family. God adds us, right? So we don't always get to choose where we get added. How many of you guys have been added sometimes and you're like, I didn't choose you, but God did, right? That's a big part of spiritual family. Now, one of the biggest privileges I get to do here at Mid Cities is I get to help lead our men's ministry. And so if you are a man in this house, this coming Saturday, the 11th, we're going to have our last 2021st, 2021 uh, men's breakfast at 8 a.m. right here in the box. You don't want to miss that. It's this coming Saturday at 8 a.m. Join us for that. And in the second, one of the second greatest privileges I have here at Mid-Cities is I get to lead our college ministry. Now I've asked Jarek to come join me real quick. Jarek, give it up for Jarek. He's a baseball player from Midland College. Um, Jarek, you're going you're gonna to grab that microphone right there. I asked Jarek, just, I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to just have Jarek come share his testimony before I get going because the sermon today is all about loving God and loving others. Jarek, not, not too long ago, had an encounter with God and now genuinely loves God. And that love for God is translated in him learning how to love others. Jarek, tell us what God has done in your life in the last couple months and how you love God and others. Good morning. How are y'all doing? So this is a little unexpected, but I'm an Ernie. I met Ernie. Hey, we led by the Spirit. Yeah, we are. I was saying that, you know. <laughs> You're right. Um, but I met, I met Ernie, just a little background. I met Ernie at the college ministry. My head coach from Midland College introduced me to him. And, and ever since then, we got to meet together and, and kind of just um, grow. And it's been really, really cool. But just a little bit about my story. Um, I grew up knowing who God was, but I didn't, I didn't really understand what he called us to do. I was always in church every Sunday, um, but man, I was really seeking joy from the world. I was seeking in alcohol, I was seeking in women, I was seeking in a ton from baseball, but it never really filled my heart. And there was this constant cycle of looking to the world for fulfillment instead of looking for, looking for it in God. And over quarantine, right, my mom is a doctor and she was not letting me leave the house, like at all. And so I was alone stuck and then I, I was and when you're alone and stuck you have to think you have to be real with yourself and man I, I realized how broken I was and how empty I was without these things wow. and so I began to read the word and and over the time I was like oh my gosh being a Christian isn't just following rules it's not like this boring life it's actually this amazing walk with God where we get to know the creator of our universe right like and, and that's and that's where the joy of the Lord really entered my heart and I was like oh my gosh I don't even want to do those things anymore. And, and it was just an incredible transformation over time that the Lord has done in my heart. And man, it's just been incredible to see the joy, the fulfillment, the community that he's blessed me with. And it is a life that I would never want to go back and live was the life before I knew Jesus. And so that's kind of the Come story on. that's in my life. That's amazing. Give it up. That's amazing, buddy. Thanks. Now, I would have... I knew I would rob you not hearing this testimony, Jarek and a bunch. If, you've, if you're in college, stand up real quick. If you're, in a, if you're a college student in, in, here this morning, stand up real quick. Let's give them a hand. So we have several baseball players. We have a basketball player from Canada. And so second service, we'll have some more. Let's just quickly all pray for our college students. They are entering finals week, and then most of them will go home by this coming weekend. So let's pray for them. Let's join me. Father, we thank you for these precious young lives, the next generation. Lord, we thank you for the testimonies that's coming from their mouths, Lord. Lord, how they are encountering the living God and how you're changing them. Lord, we pray that you would bless them and finals. We give them a special extra grace, Father God, to do well in their tests, Father God. Um, give them courage and strength and confidence as they take this test. And Lord, I pray that you would give them safe travels back home and bring them safely back to us in January. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Jarek. Thanks, everybody. Okay, now I've been tasked... Uh, to preach and conclude our series called In the Light out of the book of 1 John. Now, this is one of my favorite books in the Bible. I, I, John must be my, one of my favorite, if not the favorite, New Testament author that I have. Not that the others are not good. I just love the way he writes and the way he communicates. I think it's very, um, it's almost got a modern vernacular to it somewhat. It, it speaks a language that's so much easier to understand, in my opinion, than some of the other writings. He, he's a very clear communicator of the intent of God and in in his, uh, his letter, his epistle 
to the church in Ephesus in, in, in 1 John chapter 5 that um, our friend Mike read for us, we see his heart. And here's what John was most concerned with in all his letters, the gospel of John, the three epistles he wrote, and the book of Revelation. The, it's about four or five books that's attributed to him that he wrote. Here's what he was most concerned by. And this is what we need to understand about the writer and saying what was his intentions. And here's what he intended. He was intended on helping Christians understand the three basics of Christian living. He wanted you and I to know the three basic focuses and tenets of Christian living. The first was true doctrine. There's a big word called orthodoxy, the right belief. And then the second one was obedient living. He wanted people to actually learn and walk in obedience with God because that's what Jesus taught. That's also called orthopraxy. So orthodoxy is right belief, right thinking about God. Orthopraxy is the right um, living in front of God. In other words, we can't just believe in Him and not live right. We, we can't live right and, and, and unless we believe in Him. So those two goes hand in hand. And then the, the third thing he tried to communicate was faithful devotion. John was concerned about Christians being faithfully devoted. Now, most of you guys may know this. Some of you may not. Epistles are New Testament letters written to specific churches because of specific issues that was going on. So they, the writers were addressing things that was happening. The, now, John, who wrote this son of Zebedee, was living at this time in Ephesus, okay? Th that's what we believe. That's the, all the evidence points to this. And Ephesus was a very affluent community. It was a port city. There was a lot of wealth. There was a, a lot of opportunity. There was a lot of new ideas coming in and out. It was almost like modern America that there's such a wide variety of things happening, this opportunity, this wealth and what happened because of that there's so many new interesting things coming and going people were so easily deceived much like today much like today we are so quick to forget the truth about God and replace it or exchange it for a false idea or narrative that maybe confirms or feels better to us in our situation or circumstances John, when he wrote this letter, was concerned about them believing the right thing about God, about them living the right way before God, and about them staying the church, staying faithfully devoted to God. Now, I, I need to point this out and, and, and really emphasize this. What you believe will precede how you behave. What you believe will precede how you behave. So what we believe determines our actions. If someone acts a certain way, it's because in his heart or her heart, they believe a certain thing. And that's why Paul wrote to them. And here's, I love what he wrote, 1 John 5, 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves him who's been born of him. By this we know that we, have, we, we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. Verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God comes, um, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. In verse 5, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? As I prayed about this sermon, as I prayed about this passage, as I reflected on what Pastor Daniel and Pastor Andrew preached on, I, I was overwhelmed by this idea of who wins. Anyone in here sometimes care about who wins? Any one of y'all concerned? I bet you if we pulled up your Siri search history while you're driving, hey, who won the game? Right? Or if you go to your Google or your Safari search history, we know you're concerned about winning. I am. We all are. Last night at about 10.30, I was Googling who won the game. UTBB football had their first bowl game ever in the history, and they lost by three points. They lost, but I wanted to know who won. We care about the score. We all are scorekeepers. We all want to win. We all care about winning in life. It's something that plagues the human soul. We can't escape it. So we care about, is our kids winning? Is your child winning? Is your marriage winning? Is my investment portfolio winning? Come on. Like we all have some concern about winning. Is my stats getting better? Am I doing good in school? Am I winning? We all want to know this. And I believe John addressed this here in these five verses. He clearly indicated who wins. 
and how we win. And I love that the first thing he said here, and my first point <clears throat> is everyone who believes. Who wins? Everyone who believes. What does this mean? He says, everyone who believes that Jesus Christ has been born of God, everyone that has put their faith in Jesus Christ as the true Son of God, God who became a man, lived the life that we should have lived, died the penalty, took the penalty, took the punishment that we actually deserve in our place, was raised from the dead on the third day, proving that He is God. And it's called us to believe and trust and follow him and obey him for the rest of our lives. Everyone, everybody, it doesn't matter if this happens to you in prison. It doesn't matter if this happens to you up in your office on the 20th floor or maybe the 15th floor. Because I don't know if there's many buildings in Midland Odessa that's got 20 floors. It doesn't matter if it happens on an airplane. It doesn't ha matter if it happens on the college campus in a dorm room or in a high school room or in a locker room. It doesn't matter. But everyone, every person that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that's born of God, He came from God as God's solution for our problem, that person will be saved. This is great news. Now, John knew at this time. So see, when John wrote this letter, this is about 85 to 95 after Christ. So the church already was started. When you read the book of Acts and look how the church was birthed and then grew, this is a little bit after. So John is writing from a different perspective. He is now seeing people already are exchanging God's truth, the right belief, orthodoxy, for false teaching and ideologies. And it's grossly misleading. He says, no, 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 there's no other way to salvation. There's no other way to God except through Jesus, the one who came from God. Jesus, and see, at that time, see, heresy and false beliefs about Jesus is not a modern problem. This was tracing back all the way to the early church. The Nicene Creed, the Apostle Creed, all the creeds we have in Christianity, all the letters, books, things were always, the church fathers wrote extensively about this idea of false ideas that was trying to come in and convolute and change the message that God sent to us in the Son, Jesus. He says, if you believe that Jesus Christ is who He said He is, he is who the Old Testament letters and prophecies and writings said he would be. You are a child of God. You, my friend, if you believe in Jesus, the true Jesus, are a son and a daughter of the Most High. There's a security there. There's a finality there. Not you will become, you are. That's great news for us. We can't live our Christian lives as people hoping that God likes us. We need to live our Christian lives from a position knowing that our God doesn't just love us, but He defends us. He's our defender. He's our advocate. If you believe in the true Christ, you are saved. You are born again. There's been a new birth. There's a new you. Come on, someone. You've been made completely new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that anyone that's in Christ has become a new creation. The old has passed away, the new is now here. If someone reminds you of your past, which they will, including the devil himself, all you say is, hey, 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 I am new. Jesus took all of that. I'm a new man. I'm a new person. We did a mission trip to France one day. Uh, many years ago, and one of the guys that was, one of my best friends that was playing at that time, he only met the Jesus, the, the saved Ernie. He didn't meet the before Jesus Ernie. So there was a guy on his team that knew the before Jesus Ernie. And when this guy heard that Ernie was coming to France to do like a spiritual meeting, he wouldn't believe it. He said, that's not, that's not possible. In, in, in fact, he refused to come to our athletes' conference in Lyon, France. It's in the middle of France because of me. And I told my friend, I said, Lynn, his name is Lynn. I said, Lynn, tell him that everything he believes about me is true. In fact, I was far worse than he ever knew I was. And there was so much more darkness in me that I had that he's not even aware of. Say, say, but tell him that God really changed Ernie's heart. And at least come and hear his testimony. That guy ended up coming 
spending a day with us, and that night he gave his life to the Lord. He saw a miracle. Because everyone who believes, everyone who believes in the Son will be born again. There's a new birth. You are no longer of this world. You are now of God. That's what John said. This is not about your social status, your ability to act better than those around you. This is about your faith being completely, solely, utterly on Christ and Him alone and a desire to surrender your life. If you are willing to do that, and if that is you, you, my friends, are born again. You are a new man and a new woman. Your past will be remembered by God no more. You are free in the name of Jesus. This is great news. How many times does Christians walk away wondering how God feels about them? That's not the way Christians should live. We must know that God loves us. We must know because we believe. We've experienced a new life in Christ. The world doesn't need the church, the body of Christ, to be a a kind of light, a, a dim light. It needs to be a bright light that points them to truth. You and I are the light of the world out there. Everyone who believes, this is what John said. Now, a lot of people, this was happening back then, still happens today, was saying, well, Jesus does save us, but you also have to earn your salvation. It's like a partnership. God did something, and you've got to do something. And John said, no, 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 no. Everyone that has confidence that Jesus' work was enough, that what he did was enough, and that put their faith, in fact, not enough, was exclusively enough. The only way for us to be born again, every person that gets to that point. See, the starting point of Christianity, that where, you be, where you become a Christian is not when you learn about God. It's not when you actually believe that Jesus existed. It's when you get to a place where you recognize, wow, I can't save myself. If I lived a billion years and started a million orphanages and helped 400 million people and fed the poor and I did all these good things, If you didn't at some point recognize the poverty of your own soul and your need for a Savior, you cannot be a Christian. He said everyone, that's a pretty wide spectrum, everybody, it's pretty inclusive, who believes that Jesus was the Son of God, born of God, is a child of God. Who's your faith in? Is your faith in what you can do for Him? Or is your faith completely, solely, exclusively and what he did for you. Everyone who believes. Second point I want to make is everyone who loves. Now this is where it comes to orthopraxy. So the first belief, everyone who believes is orthodoxy. It's right belief. We've got to believe the actual gospel, not some cultural version of the gospel, the good news. We have to believe the gospel that God gave us in the Son that Jesus preached, the apostles taught. Now the second point, everyone who loves, this is, let me read this real quick, the second part of the first verse. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. And this, my dear friends, is where Christianity and Christianity Christianity where the rubber meets the road. Anyone that's been saved for more than five minutes understands that this is not easy. Right? Amen or oh my? Uh, Is someone with me today? Everyone who loves the Father that's born again loves those that's born again. That means that we've got to love each other. We have to prefer one another. Now this is where we see this idea of quinonia. The fellowship of believers. The fellowship is not just, oh, we were in a room together. It's saying, no, we looked forward to getting in a room together because we love one another. We are excited about each other. And we are excited about the God that we, not me, we worship. We love that God lives in my brother. I have to love Chris Kelly even though he shaves his head bald every single week. And he looks good doing it too. I have to love him. I don't get to choose him. You know, Mickey Eccles was my boss, and I really liked Pastor Mickey. And when he went to be with that evil Trinity Church in Lubbock, Texas, (laughs) that stole him away from us. I'm just joking. No one stole nothing. And I learned that Chris Kelly was going to be my boss. I thought, hmm, that Chris guy is a little different than I am. You know, Chris cares a lot about numbers. I care a little bit more about other things. He cares a lot about being on time, and I just don't know if God cares that much about time. (laughs) Seems like he exists outside of it, you know, and I'm his child, you know. 
And I started seeing the Lord put a genuine deep love in my heart. And now I look forward to seeing Chris Kelly. He's one of my favorite people. And it's a privilege and a joy and an honor to get to work with him. Now, Chris is not that hard to love. There's some other Christians, it's a little harder to love. Maybe it's someone that doesn't vote the way you vote. Maybe it's someone that's not as concerned about the thing you think they should really be concerned about. Maybe it's someone that doesn't have the same skin color and cultural preferences than you. Maybe it's someone that has very different passions from you in life. And you look at them and you think, Lord, I know you love them, but I don't understand why. You know, this is the reality of Christianity. He said, this is what John said, everyone who loves the Father will love those that's born again. This is the proof of a true Christian. It's not, I can't say, oh, I believe in God. I believe in the Son, but I have no love for the church. I have no love for those that's in the church. That's the wrong way. That's not Christianity. That's the wrong practice. That's not orthopraxy. That's not the right practice of Christian living. John was concerned about this because he saw people that was claiming devotion to Christ, yet they lived in offense and perpetual frustration and anger towards those who believe they sued one another. They did horrible things to one another. They had no true love for each other. And what happened was they thought, well, I'm born again. And they gave themselves a pass, they gave themselves grace, but they wouldn't extend, extend that same grace to the others that's in the body of Christ. See, the body of Christ is not a group of people, it's not a social club. It's a place where people have recognized their need for a Savior, saying, man, I am a filthy sinner, the worst of the worst God, and I can't believe you would even look at me, and then you receive this gift. And then you look up and you recognize there's others that's received the same gift. And how can you hold their sin against them if God no longer holds your sin against you? Everyone who is born of God, everyone who believes is born of God. And everyone who loves is born of God. If you do not love your brothers and sisters in Christ, you have to repent. You have to change your thinking about this. We cannot be a place where people come in and they are criticized. I'm not saying that we need to condone bad practices. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is we need to learn how to love one another. I remember the Lord recently convicted me of this. I recognized that I actually have a tendency to care a little bit more about people that's not a part of the church yet, that's lost, than I do about people that's in the church. Now, let me just say this. It's easier to love people you don't know than to love people you do know. Amen? I mean, because the people you don't know haven't had a chance to offend you yet. They haven't had a chance to make you mad yet. They haven't had a chance to come and confront you and, and expose some areas of weakness in you yet. So you have no defense system or mechanism against them yet, but it's only a matter of time that you will unless you do what John said here. Say, I can't do this. Now, let me just tell you, is this possible? By the grace of God, Yes. This is the hardest thing about Christianity. I mean, how many of y'all are married in here? Let me see some married couples. Has this been easy or hard? Be careful. <laughs> we know that's a rhetorical question. You don't yell that one out. Yes, it's been hard. <laughs> really? <laughs> being married is one of the greatest privileges any human being will ever have. But it's one of the greatest challenges you'll ever experience because you get so close to another person. And you have to learn how to love them past the feelings you had initially. You have to learn how to develop the love that God has for them for that person. You see them at their worst and at their best. There's not just a date night anymore. You have to live with each other and then still go on a date and then decide, do I want to love this person? And this is where true love comes in. This is the love the Father has for the church. He doesn't love us because we act well. He loved us before we knew him. And see, that type of love, an unconditional love, penetrates our hearts as Christians. When we're born again, the love of God penetrates us. And it saturates us. And it works in us. And we find ourselves loving others better. We find ourselves asking God for forgiveness for not loving people the right way. 
We turn away from bad habits and cultural nuances that's completely acceptable in culture, but not acceptable in the kingdom of God's culture. And we conform to the hand of God and the, the, princi the, pr the pr uh, principles of heaven. We renounce cultural nuances in worldly ways. Everyone who's born of God, who believes, is born again. And everyone that's born again is called to love others. And here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you need to pretend like you do. You need to actually love them. You need to eat with one another. You need to go and have coffee with one another. You need to learn how to do life with one another. And I, for a moment, want to speak to men, if I may. Men, the days of us hiding behind our fears of being known is over. We too must be engaged. Our wives can be in Bible studies, but we don't go. Our wives can have meaningful, godly, Christian, koinonia, fellowship, true fellowship with other believers, have people praying for them, and we out there just trying to survive on our own. See, when we love God, we love His people, which means we actually engage them willfully and perpetually, constantly, and we stay engaged with Him. Well, I don't know if He'll like me if He knows me. That's okay. You're going to have to learn to like Him too when you get to know Him. We have to learn how to love one another. Don't rob yourself, man. Don't rob yourself of the beauty and the power of koinonia, fellowship with God's people. You know, all over the world, there's a, a trend that women attend church better than men do. That's not the right way. That's not God's way. As men, we need to say, you know what? I'm not just going to show up at church. I'm going to be a part of the church. I'm going to serve in the church. I'm going to walk with other men and people in the church. I'm going to be who God's called me in this church, which means we've got to die to ourselves a little bit more. Christianity is not easy. If you thought Christianity, when you become a Christian, all of a sudden you're not going to have storms of life come. You're not going to have adversity. Everybody's going to be your best friends. You have another thing coming. Christianity is, apart from the grace of God, impossible to live. It is hard. You're going, to you're going to have to forgive people that's not even sorry. You're going to have to love people that doesn't love you. You're going to have to extend grace to people that won't extend grace to you. That's a part of Christianity because we, as John wrote to us, are more concerned about what God thinks and we want to conform to God's thoughts than what's culturally acceptable even in a negative church culture. The church must reflect God. It's in the church where we fight for the things that God cares about. How can the world know who God is if they don't see it in God's people? They see it in us. This means we've got to get on our knees before God. I don't know if you have these types of relationships, but I go to people and tell them my biggest fears and sins and weaknesses, and they still love me. And they don't just say, oh, that's okay. They don't cuddle me in my sin. They call me out of it. And then if they can't call me out of it, they pray me out of it. They push me out of it. You need a team of people behind you to push you to live this life. And if you're not committed, you will never make this. This is the fact. Christianity is not convenient. God has asked me and you to do things that we didn't want to do. Am I right? God has called us places to go where we didn't want to go. In, in John 21, the same, same author, he said to Peter when God restored Peter, he said, listen, people is going to dress you and do with you things that you would not want them to do with you. You are going to die, Peter. You're going to die to yourself and what you want, and you're going to be alive to God. You're going to be a born-again man living a born-again life. There's a lot of death in Jesus, but there's a great life waiting for those that's willing to die. How far are we willing to go? Thank you for that half a clap. How far are we willing to go as believers? How much do we love this God that we call on who's paid for our sins? You know, when you lay in bed, as, in bed at night as a born-again Christian, you have a completely clean conscience because Christ was brutally massacred, murdered for my sin and for your sin. And because of His price, I am free. Because of His pain, I have peace. Because of his work, I have grace. We too, as Jesus did and modeled this, we're going to have to go through some painful things. 
But let me tell you, in verse 4, he said, in the end of verse 3, he says, and his commandments are not burdensome. These commandments, yeah, they're not easy. But you know, it's far heavier to live under the burden of sin and the weight of sin than living under the burden of the grace of God. Living the right way always is harder up front but ends up being a lighter burden than what sin will invoke in your life. See, what the thing about sin is sin doesn't show you the price tag. Sin says, come drive this car and you'll pay later and you, ooh, enjoy this. This is nice. Then later you get slammed with massive interest rates and you realize, man, I'm robbing myself and getting poor here. And I'm paying far more for this car, for this, this moment than I intended to pay. And God's up front. He says, hey, listen, don't come follow me unless you're willing to die. The builder doesn't build a house unless he first makes his, his, his math, does his math and, and counts the cost of what it would cost. Are you willing to die to work with him? And I know if you are a true Christian and you're sitting in this room today, a true born again Christian, you love God. And because we love God, we have to grow in loving others. We have to think about others as highly as we think of our own salvation. I have to be quick to forgive slow to anger, cut gossip out of your life, and love the church, love the body of Christ. I think Pastor Daniel mentioned this. A lot of people will say stuff like, I love God, I just don't like his church. It's just, it's not the right saying. It sounds cool, but it's not okay. Jesus died for you, and you're part of his church. We should fight for the church. Sometimes we have to bleed for the church. We overextend ourselves for the church. That's what we do because we love God and those that love him. Final point, everyone who believes is born again. Everyone who loves God, the Father, loves those that's born of him. And lastly, everyone who loves God obeys. Obedience is the evidence of true salvation. And and I'm not saying perfect obedience. Listen, if you think that I'm saying that you have to be perfect, that's not what I'm saying because I myself am not standing here a perfect man. You go ask Pastor Daniel right after the service, how much sin does Ernie have? And he'll say, too much to count. I often am in his office. I'm often in Chris's office asking them to help me grow in areas that God's calling me to grow in. But we have to have at least a desire to obey God. See, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh cannot rule the believer. It cannot. Why? Because our faith has overcome the flesh. Our faith has overcome the principalities of this world. And I want to close with this. Here's in verse 4. It says, everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. This is only possible. And then he says here, "And uh, and, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. It's the moment we put our faith in Jesus and we respond the right way with the right mentality to the work of Jesus, the atonement, the payment that God made for us, for you and me, the solution for our problem. The moment we respond in complete faith and truly surrender in faith, we become an overcomer. We win. When we ask the question, who wins? If you're in Christ and your faith is in Christ alone and you love God, you love his people and you're willing to obey his commandments, You, my friends, are winning. You're winning in life. You're not perfect. You probably have a lot of room for growth. So do I. So do all of us. But we are more than conquerors in Christ. We have been called by God to win. We have been called by God to be victorious. Christians are not people that's just slaves to sin anymore. We are now sons and daughters of the Most High, and we overcome sin by faith. Faith is a powerful agent, and faith is an all or nothing proposal. Faith is saying, I'm all in or I'm all out. And the moment you get to a place and you say, God, I have complete faith that Jesus, you are of God, you were, born again. you were born of a man, came from the Father to pay a perfect price, a holy price for my life. And you receive the gift of grace that God extends to us through Jesus. Orthodoxy, the right belief, the proper response to the gospel. And then all of a sudden your heart changes and you start living differently. I didn't know this about Christianity until I was 19. I found this out in college when someone sat down with me and said, Ernie, I don't know if you understand Christianity. 
You can't love God and sleep with your girlfriend. I was shocked that he said that. I said, are you, are you crazy? What do you mean? I mean, I love God. I'm, 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 I'm paid. My sins are paid for. And there's this thing called anti antinomianism. Martin Luther is the first guy that used that word where we as people start believing that because of the grace of God and the payment of Jesus, we no longer have to live by the moral laws of the Old Testament. Anti, we're against the, the ways of God. And then what happens, we think we can have, have Jesus but not live in holiness. And here's what John said, no, 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 no. When you love him, you obey him. And in fact, in your obedience to God, we see your love for God. How far are you willing to obey him, even unto death? Even if it means you'll lose everything? If that's you, my friend, I'm happy to confirm in you that you are a child of God. If you are not willing to go that far for God, I think that you need to reconsider whether your faith is really in him and whether you're truly an overcomer. Let's stand and respond to this message. You're in my hand. I have what we know as a communion cup. <clears throat> this cup is a resemblance of the blood of Jesus and the body of Christ, right? So he was bruised for our transgressions. That's why we have the body. And before we take it, we break it as a memory. And you, you, if you have communion on, you're great. If you don't, I'm not actually going to have us take communion. You can if you want to. I want to explain this because on Christmas Eve, we're going to all come together and take communion together. But I want to show you what happens. And I believe this is what John communicated. He said, everyone who believes in, in, in the Son is born again. Everyone who, lo who loves the Father loves those that's born of Him. And everyone who loves the Father loves those that's born of Him, obeys God. And here's what happens. When we come to the communion table and we sit with, with, we sit with other believers. At the table, we're not alone. At the table, I'm with Benny. I'm with him. I'm with his wife. I'm with his kids. I'm with everybody that's of the household of God. So when I come to the table to take communion, to partake of the elements, to partake of the blood and the body, I have to come with complete confidence in who Jesus is, complete faith in the work of Jesus and for and what he did. And then I have to come with a willingness to forgive anyone that's at the table. And, and not just to forgive them, to love them, to walk with them to be committed to them. The early church was known for their generosity to one another. People that had extra land would sell it and give it to people that needed it, that was in the household of God. It, I mean, there was a sincere love for God and one another. And to this day, I have seen this and experienced this. I've been a benefactor of the Quinonia, true fellowship of believers. How many of you guys have been impacted by the body of Christ? You've experienced the love of God through other people. Now, you're my friends. I want, to, I, want to, I want to ask you, God's calling us to grow in this. And when we look at this cup and we look at this body, we look at this blood and we look at this body, and we come to the table of the Lord, we say, Father, we believe in you and we love you with all our heart. And because we love you, we love everyone that you love. And I want, to just I want us to have a moment of just corporate. You see, a lot of Western thinking is me. It's I. It's me and the Lord. Some people will say their faith is it's just between me and God, and it's so private. And it is. It is between you and the Lord, but it's also between you and others and those that love God. I want us to have a moment of just, I want you to search your own heart. And all of this leading up to Christmas when we're going to continue to celebrate the Savior, our Savior, the Savior of the world, and say, am I harboring anything that's not from the Lord? Am I harboring things against my spouse that's not from God? God forgave your wife and your husband, so you should forgive too. And it's not always repentance to us that precedes forgiveness. We need to extend forgiveness while God's bringing people to a place of repentance. Amen? Sometimes you need to let God work on them and, and work in them. But you can't hold on to that stuff. Maybe your child has done something and you just can't believe that your kid did that. Any parents in here is like, don't put your hand up. That's like, I... I I knew they said teenagers were hard, but I didn't know it's this hard. And your love is being tested and you want to hold on to things that God's forgiven them of. And you keep treating them and reminding them of their mistakes and you're not moving on and you're not reminding them of the payment that Jesus made for their sins. We don't want to slap people's sin. That's, if people believe in Jesus and are true Christians, you don't want to slap their sin on them, slap the grace of God on them. 
Say, man, just like I'm forgiven, you're forgiven. Now, we call each other to repentance. We, we have strong and healthy conversations. We can't hold on to that which is wrong. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us if there's anything in our hearts towards the Son, a wrong belief towards Jesus, or a wrong practice. We're not actually loving others as well as we need to. And God's calling us to love better, to love God right and to love others better. And I want you to just, and under your own breath, just say, just, Lord, forgive me. I, I lay these things down. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a few people. Maybe it's a situation. Maybe it's a manager. Maybe it's a family member where they're not sorry. They haven't asked for forgiveness, but you, by faith, are overcoming the trap of the enemy and saying, no, I'm forgiven because I've been forgiven. He who has been forgiven much loves much. And just say, Lord, I forgive them. Lord, I will not hold their transgressions against them because you don't hold mine against me. Lord, I will not live a life of being offended. I will walk in a life of faith. I will live a life of winning, of overcoming by faith. Just have a moment just between you and the Lord. Just ask God, lay it down before Him. You know the Holy Spirit will put it on your heart. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray for every heart in this room. Lord, we are your body. We are your church. Lord, I pray that we would love your church better. We would love one another better. Lord, I thank you that this is possible by faith. That it's our faith in Jesus that doesn't just save us, but it enables us. Your spirit is now working in us and we are able to live the Christian life. Lord, of believing the right things, of practicing the right things, and of being faithful and devoted to you and your church. Lord, I bless my friends. I pray, Lord, as we go into a Christmas season of a lot of family and reflection on you and spending a lot of time with others, Lord, let this Christmas be different. Let this Christmas be a time of true thankfulness and gratitude, even for people that we maybe aren't as excited about seeing. I pray that your love for others will flood our hearts and that your grace will empower us and embolden us in the things of God. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say, amen.